And that's what I want to do now. I'm going to throw up an object, a golf ball or an apple, in 26100. And we know that it's in a vertical plane, so we, have, we only deal with a two-dimensional problem, this being, I call this my x-axis, and I'm going to call this my y-axis. I call this increasing value of x, and I call this increasing value of y. I could have called this increasing value of y. Today I have decided to call this increasing value of y. I'm free in that choice. I throw up an object at a certain angle, and I see a motion like this. Boing, and it comes back to the ground. My initial speed when I threw it was V zero, and the angle here is alpha. The x component of that initial velocity is V zero cosine alpha, and the y component equals V zero sine alpha. So that's the begin's velocity of in the x direction, and this is the begin velocity in the y direction. A little later in time, that object is here at point P, and this is now the position vector, which we have called R of T. That's this vector. That's the vector that is moving through space. At this moment in time, x of t is here. And at this moment in time, y of t is here. And now you're going to see, for the first time, a big gain by the way that we have divided the two axes, which live an independent life. First x. I want to know everything about x that there has to be known. I want to know where it is at any moment in time, velocity and the acceleration, only in x. First, I want to know that at t equals zero. Well, at t equals zero, I look there, x zero, that's the, I can choose that to be zero. So I can say x zero is zero, that's my free choice. Now I need v zero x. What is the velocity? The velocity at t equals zero, which we have called v zero x, is this velocity, v zero cosine alpha, and is not going to change. Why is it not going to change? Because there is no a of x. So this term here is zero. We only have this one. So at all moments in time, the velocity in the x direction is v zero cosine alpha, and the a of x <coughs> equals zero. Now I want to do the same in the x direction for time t. Well, at time t, I look there at the first equation. Uh, uh, there it is. x zero is zero. I know v zero x, that is v zero cosine alpha. So x of t is v zero cosine alpha times t. But there is no acceleration, so that's it. What is v x of t? The velocity in the x direction at any moment in time. That's that, that, that is that equation. That is simply v zero x. It is not changing in time because there is no acceleration. So the initial velocity at t zero is the same as t seconds later. And the acceleration is zero. And now we're going to do this for the y direction. And now you begin to see the gain for the decomposition. In the y direction, we change the x by a y. And so we do it first at t equals zero. So look there. This becomes y zero, I call that zero. I can always call my origin zero. 
I get V0y times t. Well, V0y is this quantity, it's V0 sine alpha, V0 sine alpha. This is V0 sine alpha, that is the velocity at time zero, and this is zero. At time zero, this is zero at time zero. What is the acceleration in the y direction at time zero? What is the acceleration? That has to do with gravity. There is no acceleration in the x direction, but you better believe it, there is one in the y direction. So only when we deal with the y equations does this acceleration come in, not at all when we deal with the x direction. Well, if we call the acceleration due to gravity g equals plus 9.80, and I always call it g, what would be the acceleration in the y direction, given the fact that I call this increasing value of y? <laughs> minus 9.8, which I will also say always call minus g, because my g is always positive. So it is minus g. So that tells the story at t equals zero in the y direction, and now we have to complete it at time t equals t. At time t equals t, we have the first line there, y zero is zero, so we have y as a function of time, y zero is zero, so we don't have to work with that. Where is my, so this is zero, so I get v zero y times t, so I get v zero sine alpha times t, plus one half, but it is minus one half g t squared, and now I get the velocity in the y direction at time t, that is my second line, that is going to be v zero sine alpha minus g t, and the acceleration in the y direction at any moment in time equals minus g. And now I have done all I can to completely decompose this complicated motion into two entirely independent one-dimensional motions. And the next lecture, we're going to use this again and again and again and again. This lecture is not over yet, but I want you to know that this is what we're going to apply for many lectures to come, the decomposition of a complicated trajectory into two simple ones. Now when you look at this, there is something quite remarkable. And the remarkable thing is that the velocity in the x direction throughout this whole trajectory, if there is no air drag, if there is no friction, is not changing. It's only the velocity in the y direction that is changing. It means if I throw up this golf ball, I throw it up like this, and it has a certain component in x direction, a certain velocity, if I move myself with exactly that same velocity, with exactly the same horizontal velocity, I could catch the ball here. It would, it would have to come back exactly in my hands. That is because there is only an acceleration in the y direction, but the motion in the y direction is completely independent of the x direction. The x direction doesn't even know what's going on in the y direction. In the x direction, if I throw an object like this, the x direction simply, very boringly, moves with a constant velocity. There is no time dependence. And the y direction on its own does its own thing. It goes up, comes to a halt, and it stops. And of course the actual motion is the sum, the superposition of the two. We have tried to find a way to demonstrate this quite bizarre behavior, which is not so intuitive, that the x direction really lives a life of its own. And the way we want to do that is as follows. We have here a golf ball, a, a gun, we can shoot up the golf ball, and we do that in such a way that the golf ball, if we do it correctly, exactly comes back here. That's not easy. That takes hours and hours of adjustment. The golf ball goes up and comes back here. Not here, not here, not there. That's easy. 
can shoot it up a little at an angle, and the golf ball will come back here. Once we have achieved that, that the golf ball will come back there, then I'm going to give this car a push. And the moment that it passes through this switch, the golf ball will fire. So the golf ball will go straight up, as seen from the car. But it has a horizontal velocity, which is exactly the same horizontal velocity as the car. So the car, I like my hands. As the golf ball goes like this, the car stays always exactly under the golf ball. Always exactly under the golf ball. And if all works well, the ball ends up exactly on the car again. Let me first show you, otherwise if that doesn't work, of course it's all over, that if we shoot the ball straight up, that it comes back here. If it doesn't do that, I don't even have to try this more complicated experiment. So here's the golf ball. I'm going to fire the gun now. Close. Close. Reasonably close. Well, since it's only reasonably close, <laughs> perhaps... <laughs> Perhaps it would help if we give it a little bit of leeway. There goes the gun. Here comes the ball. And this is just in case. Tape it down. So as I'm going to push this now, give it a push. The gun will be triggered when the middle of the car is here. You've seen how high that ball goes, so that ball will go <laughs> And depending upon how hard I push it, they may meet here or they may meet there. You ready for this? You ready? Yes. I'm ready. <laughs> Physics works. See you Wednesday. <laughs>